Hey everyone, sorry for the the delay. Uh, we're here with Gilad Bandel. Gilad leads the automotive cybersecurity business development and product marketing and simultive technologies. His focus is on delivering state of the art, unique and innovative uh, solution for automotive cybersecurity protection. Uh, his presentation is about is cybersecurity protection of commercial vehicles harder. Uh, of course, you can, uh, during the session, ask questions and answers uh, on the tab or raise your hand and uh, give out the stage is yours. Thank you, Eden. So today we're going to speak about commercial vehicles and how those commercial vehicles are different than passenger vehicles. How do we look at the cybersecurity aspects of those commercial vehicles? What are the tools? What are the risks? Um, and so on. So first of all, let's understand that passenger vehicles account for more than 60% of the uh, overall vehicles. But this is a deceiving number because commercial vehicles travel by far longer distances. So if you count uh, car per kilometer, you find many, many more uh, commercial vehicles. The lifespan of a commercial vehicle is longer. So they last longer. So not only that they drive longer distances and more hours, they also last for many, many more years. In terms of the impact, the commercial vehicle are part of a critical infrastructure. So they carry goods, they are part of the uh, military, they carry forces, if needed troops, uh, so if you are able to damage uh, passenger vehicles, worst case is uh, people won't go to work. Uh, but if you are able to damage and attack a commercial vehicle, the damage is by far uh, higher. Keep in mind that those uh, vehicles are much heavier. So if you are able to cause an accident with a commercial vehicle, the damage, the number of casualties, the number of uh, people hurt, the damage to property would be much higher. So as we can all understand, commercial vehicles are unique in risks. They have many enemies. It would be not the hacker or the, the thief that you're looking at. Those would be terrorist uh, states, criminals. And keep in mind the owners as well can be attacking their own vehicle. So you you might find a fleet owner or a vehicle owner that might want to do some chip tuning and might want to, to manipulate the behavior of the vehicle. So bottom line, uh, the conclusion is that commercial vehicle cannot be regarded in terms of cyber threats as passenger vehicles, and we need a special approach and we need to understand how those things happen. So in terms of motivation, why would you? So we're looking, let, let's look at the uh, upper layer. So they are light, uh, light commercial vehicles and heavy duty vehicles. So we let's concentrate on the heavy duty uh, vehicles that are more interesting. So you can find uh, those vehicles transporting billions of dollars of goods worldwide. So if you are able to disrupt the supply chain of uh, food, people would get hungry, they would starve. Um, if you're able to uh, stop the oil, then people won't be able to drive. And you don't have those tankers that are moving the the, the gas and, and petrol and all those uh, energy sources. Uh, there is a risk to mission critical. So if you have military equipment, you have uh, trucks that are moving uh, tanks, or they're moving troops, if you're able to stop those things in case of conflict, think about the uh, current Russia, the Ukraine uh, conflict. If you're able to stop due to a cyber attack, um, the trucks that are carrying the, uh, the tanks to the field, then you will have a huge, huge advantage over your enemy just by using a cyber attack. So there are a lot of motivations here. Let's look at the specific things that are unique to, uh, to commercial and heavy duty vehicles. 
So first of all, those are modular um, devices. If you look at the uh, tractor and the devices that can be appliances can, that can be attached to it, if you look at the combine, if you look at truck, a trailer, and what it's uh, down behind, all those move from one device to another. So today, one trailer can have one attachment, and the following day, the same trailer can have another attachment. This creates a very unique uh, viral effect, because if you're able to attack and infect one truck, which is attached to one attachment, and the following day, the attachment is attached to another trailer, then it will infect that trailer. And in turn, the trailer from the first day is attached to another attachment, and it's infecting that one. So you have here a viral, viral effect. This type of behavior does not exist with uh, passenger vehicles, because passenger vehicles are intact. They are a non-mutable item. It does not attach every day to something else. So the fact that this is a modular uh, environment with attachments which are being shared and moved from one vehicle to another is very unique to the uh, heavy-duty vehicles. Let's look a bit at the uh, U.S. market special case, the right to repair. So the right to repair uh, uh, influences both uh, pension vehicles and um, heavy-duty vehicles. But in the case of the heavy-duty vehicles, the impact and the risks and the opportunities for hackers to use those vulnerabilities which are inherent in the right to repair um, have much larger extent of, of impact. So the risk is, is much higher. So this thing applies more, more to the US and we need to keep this in mind. So why do we need a different approach for the commercial vehicles? We saw the risk, we saw the use cases, uh, but there are things that we need to take into consideration and they need to be built different for uh, commercial vehicles. Let's look at one of those things is the uh, fact that ECUs can be transferred from one vehicle to another. So in the passenger vehicles, in most cases, if an OEM manufactures a vehicle, it will use uh, one ECU, which is tailor-made for that vehicle. And you cannot take an ECU from one vehicle and install it in a different vehicle. This is not the case in the commercial vehicles. In this case, tier ones manufacture an ECU, and that ECU, as it is, it is carried and used by many uh, OEMs. One of the reasons this is possible is the fact that they are using the SAE J1939 protocol. The SAE J1939 protocol is a standard protocol, as opposed to the CAN bus and CAN protocol used in passenger vehicles in which every OEM, every make and model is a new Mona Lisa and everything is done uh, tailor-made. So the same message IDs and message format on one vehicle are not even the same as other cases. Here we have a case in which the protocol is the same for all, for many, uh, the protocol is the same, the implementation are, are used across the industry. So this creates a lot of flexibility and reduces cost for the uh, commercial vehicle market. But on the other side, it creates threats because if you found a vulnerability in the protocol, then you can use the same vulnerability all over again and again on other devices. And if you find a vulnerability in an ECU, which is installed on one model, then the same vulnerability can be used in all other makes and models by different OEMs uh, that are using the same ECU. And as we say, ECUs can be, uh, are used by many OEMs. So this is again, a very specific case for the, um, Heavy duty vehicles. So this is this is the the background. Uh, let's look a bit at the J1939. Uh, we need to understand a bit the protocol. I'm not going to go into the bit and bytes, but just as a high level understanding of how the protocol looks like 
and what this derives. So the J1939 is based on the canvas. The physical layer is the same physical layer. The message format in general is the same message format as the J19, as the canvas, but a few very important differences. The can ID is a long can ID. It's not 11 bits, it's 29 bits, and it has a format. It has addressing inside. The addressing is dynamic. Uh, so you might have a case in which you install an ECU uh, in one, one device, it is connected to an attachment, and today that attachment has one address, and tomorrow, because you added more attachments, the address is different. This is very different than the CAN in which the IDs are static and predictable and deterministic. So here you have some dynamic in the protocol. So if you build whitelist and the whitelist includes uh, addresses, it cannot be a static uh, method. This we needs to take into account. That means the intrusion detection system needs to be much more complex and needs to accommodate dynamic addressing. So this is a unique case which makes life a bit harder in cybersecurity terms for the J1939 and the heavy duty vehicles. Obviously it provides flexibility and there is a lot of value and uh, rationale why you would use this type of protocol. But together with the fact that it provides those values, it creates um, chances for hackers to attack the vehicle. So this is very high level um, about the frame format. One more thing uh, that's worth mentioning with the J1939 is the fact that it has a transport protocol. Yes, there is a transport protocol also on the canvas, but the uh, spread of the transport protocol on the canvas uh, is not as wide as the one with J1939. So here you have a more complex protocol running on the bus. It provides again functionality because it's, uh, it enables a seven layer protocol. It enables to do more complex things, but together with it, it creates uh, vulnerabilities. And the J1939, when it was uh, designed, there wasn't much cybersecurity thought uh, built into it. So the fact that you have a protocol which is very widespread, it is standard across the industry. It is complex and has a lot of functionalities. This uh, brings a smile to the hackers because they can do so many things uh, with this protocol. So let's look about some things that can happen uh, with this uh, protocol. So what, what we would see. So regarding the attack surfaces, obviously we also always prefer to have uh, remote attacks. It could be from the cellular, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and so on. Another thing which is interesting is the fact that those vehicles uh, need to reach a service center at a higher rate because they drive so much and they require maintenance. The fact that the vehicle arrives at the service center uh, often uh, means that it is a bit more under surveillance than a passenger vehicles which uh, sees a service center once a year. <coughs> so this a bit creates some deterrence towards physical attacks, although still possible, but it, it is a special case that we don't see in passenger vehicles. Um, the fact that this uh, device is being uh, monitored. So if anyone tried to install something on the OBD or attach something to a, to one of the buses, um, when the vehicle goes through in inspections, um, it will be detected. So this makes a life more uh, easy on the defense side and a bit harder on the attackers. As we said, the standard protocol uh, with little or no variation is a high risk. And the fact that components are interoperable, so you can take one issue from one um, vehicle and use it on another vehicle um, is a risk. Uh, is a risk because uh, once you detected the vulnerability, 
you can um, exploit it across many OEMs and many vehicles. Let's look a bit more on the uh, SAMA type vectors. I'm not, go not going to speak about all of them. Uh, many of them just focus on a few ones. Looking at the addressing, there is no authentication on the bus. So if you want to have authentication, it's not part of the protocol. You need to add an add-on, something like SecOC or other method, which I mentioned earlier in, um, in another talk. So adding authentication is a very, very good idea. But the protocol itself and the basis of the protocol have no authentication. So you can spoof message, you can impersonate, you can create a man-in-the-middle attack very, very easy. It takes for a junior cyber uh, engineer something like one to two weeks to develop an end-to-end -end, uh, attack kit on a J1939. Uh, and it can use the specifics of this thing, which are not applicable to other protocols, such as automotive Ethernet, um, or the uh, simple can that you find in passenger vehicle to attack a, um, a vehicle, so a heavy duty vehicle. So setting uh, a man in the middle attack, it's very, very easy to do it. Again, the specifics of the uh, commercial vehicles is the fact that um, they are very dynamic. There are many changes in the vehicle. Things are updated. There are additional devices that I'm going to speak later after market that are also added to the device. All in all, this creates a lot of opportunities for hackers and attackers to attack a heavy duty vehicle. Let's look at the special case of um, aftermarket. In a passenger vehicle, once the vehicle left uh, the manufacturing plant, chances are nothing will be added, changed to it for the whole life. This is very different than the um, commercial vehicles. In the commercial vehicle market, we add and change things. For example, there's something which is called ELD, electronic logging device, uh, which is an aftermarket device and many uh, fleet owners add, add those devices. Um, there are other telematic equipment which are uh, custom built uh, for the heavy duty vehicles used by many uh, fleet owners. Now, if you add an aftermarket device to a to a vehicle, the OEM does not have any any control over it, so it's not part of the supply chain. There is no assurance that this device does not come with malware installed in it. This means that if we install an ELD and we compromise it, much easier than compromising anything along the supply chain of the OEM, a new attack can be launched here. And the OEM would not know about it, would not be able to protect. And there is always the question of liability. But if you add something to your vehicle, uh, you should be responsible to it. And if you add it, there is no way you can know if this thing is uh, intact or comes with some malware installed on, installed on it. So this is a special risk that we need to address. Let's look at the software. Um, apparently, many of the companies that develop uh, software for the uh, commercial vehicles are less aware of cybersecurity threats. So the software that we find in those vehicles have a lot of vulnerabilities. Uh, actually, we found more vulnerabilities in uh, we found more vulnerabilities in those vehicles than um, than on passenger vehicles. So again, this is something which is unique. How would you mitigate those things? Obviously, you need to do the standard things that you do with any um, any vehicles. You need to comply to regulation and standard, and I'm not going to go into it uh, because most of the people know and those things were discussed uh, many times. 
the standard itself has working progress. So this is a some light at the end of the tunnel. Um, it's still um, it's still in progress, but the J1939 has a uh, extension J1939-91, which is addressing the different layers of cybersecurity. So it is looking at the ECU protection, such as secure boot, secure flash, um, authorization, authentication. This is very, very important, as I said, because the issues are interchangeable. So there are a lot of risks associated to it, and the issue itself needs to be protected. <coughs> Layer two, it's part C, uh, some mix up between the letters and the layers, um, are looking for the in-vehicle network security. This is, in my view, the most important part of the, of the new standard. And part A speaks about um, foundation of flare securities. Standardization and things like this. Last but not least is the connected vehicle. Uh, trucks become more and more connected. So here there are special uh, standards. For example, the UNR uh, 156 is the new regulation. It speaks about software security updates and the associated standard ISO 24089. Those are relatively new and they apply to all the over-the-year updates. Let's look at things to come and uh, summarize. So the SAJ 1939-91 has work in progress that addresses cybersecurity. Hopefully, it will be uh, ratified. You need to implement some type of method authentication, such as SecOC or other security, other methods, uh, keep in mind that it creates some complexity depending on the method. So, for example, if you do it in vehicle, some issues might support it, some other might not support it. The testing equipment that you are attaching to the vehicle and to the buses need to support it, so you need to have a good solution. Uh, compliance. Uh, in China, GBT, uh, the UNEC uh, countries, the UNR 155, and following the cookbook in the 21434. I think that the most important part that you have in a vehicle is to have a VXDR, Vehicle Extended Detection and Response. This is also known as the IDPS, Intrusion Detection and Prevention System, uh, that will monitor the network and the vehicle and would report to a security information and event management system at a vehicle security operations center. All in all, you need to have a cybersecurity management system and other uh, things which will protect the vehicle. So this summarizes um, the presentation and gives some insights about things to come. There are many more things to discuss and to go deeper. So I will uh, conclude here. Uh, this is just a slide about same motive and who we are. Um, if there are any questions, um, Please go ahead. So, and then I see that there are no questions at this time. So I hand over to you and thank you very much for listening. Yes, if someone has a question, you can write it down right now uh, or you can meet Gilad in the networking area and ask him uh, any question you might have. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. Ah, wait, 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 wait. Okay, so yeah. It is the difference between the risk assessment method? Okay, so Tara is a Tara is a Tara. Uh, the risks are different, but the process is the same. So you take the same process, the same concept, the same questionnaires, uh, and you run them uh, through your uh, tier ones, receive the information. So if you do vulnerability management, then you need to receive the S bombs and do the risk assessment on the on the S bombs. Uh, other than this, there are specific risks associated because the um, of the impact. But in terms of the process, the same process applies. Okay, actually, Gilad, I was wondering, is there a difference between the damage? But I couldn't <laughs> type it fast enough. 
the, the, yes, the, the, the damage, there is definitely a difference in the damage. Uh, uh, if a, a truck uh, is driven into a crowd, it can kill dozens. Uh, it can cause damage in millions. If a passenger car is driven into a crowd, uh, it can kill two, four, five people. Uh, not that I'm saying that two, four, five people and lives are not uh, worth, but in terms of uh, quantities and uh, uh, damage potential, definitely the damage potential is, is much higher. The same goes with the impact on the economy. If you stop 1,000 personal vehicles, you'll get a bit less of pollution. If you stop 1,000 uh, trucks carrying food, you'll get uh, people dying of hunger. So the impact and the damage is uh, significantly higher with uh, commercial vehicles. And you mentioned earlier also that <clears throat> the the this could have an effect on other, um, you know, the use case of a truck is much different than the use case of a vehicle, right? Right. You know, uh, transporting one person from A to B, but uh, hacking trucks could actually disrupt uh, supply chains and uh, actually have influence on other things that are going on. And so I wonder if there's uh, adaptions to the risk assessment for damage that we have to consider, which we don't in in the, the vehicle stuff, uh, in the passenger vehicle. So in, in terms of, so the answer is yes and no. If you're looking at the process of the Tara, the process remains the same process. So you go through the same steps. But when you take in consideration what is the risk because of a uh, an attack on a vehicle or the uh, attack vectors, attack scenarios, then definitely you need to take into consideration other things. Um, if you speak about the passenger vehicle, uh, there is no risk of uh, adding an attachment because you don't add an attachment to a uh, uh, passenger vehicle. However, if you speak about risk emerging from attaching some appliances uh, to a combine, a trailer, or a uh, any truck or a tractor, obviously this is different. So you don't have those cases with passenger vehicles. Um, if you ask what is the risk of using the same ECU, which is used exactly as it is in other makes and models, then um, again, it's different. In, with passenger vehicles, you don't have those cases. From the other side, if you want to attack a passenger vehicle, then you buy it for $10,000 and you can play with it as much as you want. If you want to attack a truck and you want to buy it, it costs uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, so to play with it uh, is much more expensive. We just have uh, people start to write question over the chat. I think we have one okay, or chat. two. So the first one was, and I know you answer, Yuval, is there a ready to install vehicle idea solution or are we still at the theory stage? At the theory stage. Okay, so an IDS is not a plug and play uh, thing. It's a combination. So if you want to, to install an I, IDS, IDPS in a vehicle, it's a combination of having a company that has a lot of know-how and experience with IDSs and has a uh, library set of software, whatever, and it needs to be integrated into the vehicle. So it's a project. It's a combination of a existing software. So if you want to know how good the company is, uh, you need to, to ask how many um, vehicles are running their IDS. So you have some field proven answers. From the other side, um, you need to realize that it's not a plug and play. You just uh, need to integrate. You need to build uh, the rules which are adapted to the vehicle. Um, and you need to detect and there are different policies, whether you are uh, more tended to take risk or you're more tended to protect. You want to prevent uh, false positives, uh, but you don't want to miss, miss uh, uh, alarm. So this is, this is a, a project that you need a good company. Let's go to the next question. Is there already installed? Yes, 
why cybersecurity protection of commercial vehicles harder? Um, I think that we quite address this thing that it's harder for the many reasons. For example, inter interchangeability of ECUs, um, standard protocol all around the vehicle, the, 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 the industry, if you have one vulnerability, you can apply it all over. The fact that uh, attachments are being moved from one vehicle to another and you create a vi viral attack. So definitely, yes. 40 plus yeah, states in Okay, so last just question? really last, just really last question. Last. Which OEMs are running VSOC for their commercial vehicles? Because we, uh, um, this, so is, this one. This is a question for the OEMs, uh, not for me. But all OEMs are running VSOC in some form or another. Uh, what is the extent? What is the professionality? How do they do it as a managed service, in-house, a combination? Um, it's not in the scope of this presentation. This is from my general knowledge, so I think that here uh, we stop due to lack of time, but I'm available for any questions. So uh, you can uh, write to my email. Um, I'll be available for any questions. So please um, go ahead. I'm all yours. Head and over right, to you. Thank you. Thank you.